Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named Supernatural Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a short introduction of the Winchester family, consisting of the father, John, elder brother, Dean, and younger brother, Sam. For the past 20 years, these three have been living off of counterfeit identities and credit cards, all while fighting poltergeists and ghosts as their full-time job. They are known as demon hunters. The father has a notebook which meticulously records various features and weaknesses of ghosts and poltergeists, making it an encyclopedia of the supernatural world. Over 20 years ago, the Winchesters were just an ordinary American family, but fate had other plans. Not long after baby Sam was born, their mother was killed by a mysterious shadow that appeared in Sam's nursery. She was pinned to the ceiling and consumed by a raging fire. Witnessing this inexplicable event, the father, with four-year-old Dean and newborn Sam in tow, went from believing in science to believing in the supernatural. In order to avenge their mother's death, they set out on a path of saving lives and hunting ghosts while using counterfeit credit cards to make ends meet. Twenty years have passed, and the Winchester family has lived surrounded by ghosts and monsters, constantly wielding guns and knives. Unwilling to continue this lifestyle, the grown-up Sam left his father and brother two years ago. Now he is just waiting for the interview to officially become a college student at Stanford University. Once Sam started school, it wasn't long before he found a girlfriend. Their sweet days together, however, were interrupted when Dean suddenly burst into Sam's home. It turns out their father had gone missing during a ghost hunt, and Dean needed help finding him. Reluctantly, Sam agreed to help, leaving his hot girlfriend unattended. The father left the brothers with a cryptic message and the location of his hunt, a centennial highway near Jericho, California. Over the past 20 years, there have been 10 mysterious accidents on this stretch of road, where drivers have disappeared, leaving their cars behind. The father's last message warned Dean of the danger, and after careful inspection, Dean noticed an eerie female voice in the message. One night, a hapless young man was driving on the Centennial Highway. As he hung up the phone with his girlfriend, he spotted a leggy and busty woman in a white dress by the roadside. Tempted by her allure, he offered her a ride home, hoping for a romantic encounter. However, he discovered that her home was a dilapidated, abandoned house. Realizing this was a classic ghost story setup, he quickly drove away to run for his shitty life. But before he got far, he met his end. The next morning, Dean and Sam were resting at a gas station, teasing each other as usual. Sam mocked Dean's outdated taste in music, claiming his own taste was far superior. Dean retorted that he couldn't hear Sam over the wind. The brothers then passed by the location where the young man had met his fate the previous night. Posing as FBI agents, they infiltrated the scene and gathered information about the bizarre incident. After the investigation, they swiftly left the scene, skillfully avoiding the real FBI agents. The brothers went into town and learned from the young man's girlfriend and her friends about a local legend. Twenty years prior, a sexy woman dressed in white died on that same highway. Ever since, anyone who picked up the sexy woman in white on that stretch of road would vanish, never to be seen again. Dean searched for news articles about any sexy woman's death, but found nothing. Unimpressed with his search efforts, Sam took over the computer and searched for news about the death of a woman named Constance. He discovered that 20 years ago, the sexy 24-year-old Constance had jumped to her death from the bridge on the Centennial Highway. The location of her death was exactly where the hapless young man had disappeared. Under the cover of darkness, Dean and Sam visited the site to investigate. As they argued with one another, they saw the ghostly figure of Constance who had jumped from the bridge. Her spirit used a car parked on the bridge to charge at them. To save themselves, Sam and Dean leaped off the bridge. Sam cleverly grabbed onto the railing while Dean landed in the river covered in mud. Having escaped safely, the brothers found a motel and discovered that their father had previously stayed there. Sam used his lock-picking skills to enter their father's rented room and found the walls covered in information about Constance. It turned out they were dealing with the same ghost of the woman in white who had appeared in Hawaii, Mexico, and other places. In similar legends, the woman in white went mad after discovering her husband's infidelity, killed her children, and then, consumed by guilt, took her own life. Her spirit roamed the highways in a white dress, abducting unfaithful men and making them disappear forever. The method to vanquish Constance was simple. They planned to exhume her bones and burn them to ashes to prevent further haunting. 
Dean went out to find food but was arrested by local police. The police suspected Dean and his previously investigating father were behind the strange highway incidents and produced their father's notebook as evidence. On the other side, Sam found Constance's husband and asked about the location of her grave. It turned out that the dilapidated house was Constance's home when she was alive. Sam informed the husband about the legend of the woman in white, which infuriated him, causing him to tell Sam to get lost with his smelly butts. Inside the police station, Dean took advantage of the officer's absence and used his family's lockpicking skills to escape with their father's notebook. After getting out, Dean called Sam and told him their father had left without dealing with the woman in white, leaving the brothers a set of coordinates as a clue. While driving, Sam suddenly saw Constance appear in the back seat, demanding that he take her home. Although Sam tried to refuse, Constance used her supernatural powers to force the car to the crumbling house. Once they arrived, Constance announced that she was ready to kill. Sam reminded her that she only killed the hormone-cheating men, and he hadn't met that standard so she couldn't kill him. So Constance decided to force Sam into infidelity. Sam's resistance angered Constance, who decided to kill him regardless of her principles. Fortunately, Dean arrived just in time, and Sam narrowly escaped danger by driving the car into the dilapidated house. Constance saw pictures of her and her children on the floor of the house, but still wanted to kill the brothers. At the critical moment, the ghosts of her children appeared and pulled her into the ground. It turned out they were standing where she had drowned her children years before. The ghostly children overpowered her, and now there was no need to burn her bones. With the woman in White's case finally resolved, the brothers shared a laugh. Dean drove Sam back to their apartment so he could prepare for his college interview. Back at the apartment, Sam lay down on the bed, hoping to relax. To his horror, he found his girlfriend nailed to the ceiling, and a sudden fire engulfed the room. Sam screamed, and Dean rushed in from outside to drag him out. The tragedy from 22 years ago, when their mother died, had happened again. This time, Sam could no longer remain uninvolved. He decided to join Dean in searching for their father and avenging their mother and girlfriend. Thus began the Winchester brothers' journey of battling poltergeists. Elsewhere, three camping enthusiasts were camping in the forest. Before going to bed, the guy named Tommy sent a safety video message to his sister, Haley. Deep into the night, the three friends were abducted one after another by fast-moving shadows. The Winchester brothers were heading towards the coordinates their father left them, which pointed to a forest inhabited by a group of bears. The brothers impersonated rangers and found the real ranger to inquire about the situation. However, by accident, they obtained the copied camping permits and the address of Haley. Pretending to be rangers again, they visited Haley's house and learned about the disappearance of the three campers. Tommy's parents had passed away, and he, Haley, and their younger brother Ben depended on each other. With Tommy missing, Haley planned to search for him in the mountains the next day. The Winchesters copied the video of Tommy and found a suspicious shadow in it. After some research, they discovered that people disappeared in the forest every 23 years. They also found a male survivor from a disappearance case decades ago. The brothers visited the survivor overnight, learning that the mysterious creature was agile, incredibly strong, and extremely dangerous. It had a unique roar like a goose and a deep breath. The survivor showed the brothers the scars he had from his narrow escape. The next day, Haley, Ben, and a hired old hunter met up. The Winchester brothers joined them in the forest. Dean's unprofessional behavior in the woods revealed his fake identity to Haley. He had no choice but to confess that they were looking for their father. The group arrived at the coordinates left by their father, finding a creepy atmosphere and the campsite covered in blood. They discovered traces left by the missing campers. Suddenly, they heard someone screaming for help, but found no one when they followed the sound. When they returned to the campsite, they discovered that their supplies had disappeared. It was clearly a diversion by the creature. After observing and comparing their father's notebook, Sam determined that the creature was a Wendigo. A Wendigo was once human, but during a harsh winter they resorted to cannibalism. Consuming their own kind brought them supernatural abilities, like speed, strength, and immortality. However, after consuming a certain amount, they turned into Wendigos, forever hungry, half-human monsters. Wendigos hibernated for many years and captured people as their food supply when they awoke. Faced with such a formidable opponent, Sam and Dean could only advise the group to leave. However, the old hunter and Haley insisted on staying to find Tommy. As night fell, Dean drew protective symbols around the campsite to ward off the Wendigo. The old hunter scoffed, calling it superstitious nonsense. 
Sam had no patience for this group of reckless people and believed that Dean was meddling when they could have just found their father. But Dean explained to Sam that hunting monsters was their job and finding their father while saving people was a win-win. Suddenly, the cries for help from earlier in the day returned, diverting everyone's attention. The old hunter shot the Wendigo, but foolishly left the protection circle and was swiftly killed. The remaining group huddled inside the circle, shivering and waiting for daylight. When morning came, Dean and Sam explained the unscientific world to Haley and Ben. They speculated that Tommy hadn't met the worst fate yet and was likely being kept as preserved meat in a cave by the Wendigo. To save him, they had to act fast. The four of them searched the forest until Haley and Dean were captured by the Wendigo. Cleverly, Haley left clues to guide Sam and Ben to the Wendigo's lair. Inside, Sam found Dean and Tommy, reuniting the family trio. Having saved the group, Dean and Sam planned to retreat, but the Wendigo returned. The brothers had no choice but to split up. Dean, in his role as bait, attracted the Wendigo's attention while Sam escorted the others to safety. The Wendigo caught up to Sam and the others, but just as it prepared to attack, Dean threw a firebomb, killing the creature. With the Wendigo defeated, Sam began to accept Dean's approach of saving people while searching for their father. The brothers continued on their hunting journey. One day, as they ate breakfast in a diner, Dean searched the newspaper for their next target. He discovered that a girl had drowned in a lake in a small town, but her body was never found. The lake had claimed three lives this year alone, and Dean was eager to hunt the monster. Sam, however, was more focused on finding their father. Since Dean was the boss, Sam had no choice but to follow his lead. They visited the drowned girl's family, posing as wildlife management employees, investigating the drowning. They didn't get any useful information from the girl's father or brother. They visited the local police station, where the sheriff told them the lake would be drained in six months. The brothers also met the sheriff's daughter, Andrea, and his autistic grandson. Sam believed the culprit wasn't a lake monster. Through online research, he discovered that one of the drowning victims was Andrea's husband, and the autistic child was a survivor of the incident. The child had developed post-traumatic stress disorder and refused to speak to anyone. The mother and son now lived with the sheriff, Andrea's father. The two brothers found the thin woman and her child playing in the park. Dean managed to communicate with the autistic child through drawing and received a picture of a house from him. When they drove past the drowned girl's house, they heard that her older brother had inexplicably drowned in the kitchen sink, which was connected to the lake. Dean and Sam discovered that all the victims were connected to the lake, and the people who drowned were all relatives of the resident Bill, including Andrea's husband. When they confronted Bill, they were chased away. Dean realized that Bill's house was the same one depicted in the autistic child's drawing. Since Bill wouldn't speak, they had no choice but to approach the autistic child for information. It turned out that after the drowning incident, the autistic child developed the ability to foresee events and communicate with spirits, which frightened him. Dean used his own experiences after his mother's death to comfort him. Eventually, the child gave Dean a drawing of a church, a house, a little boy, and a bicycle. Sam had never known about the painful experiences Dean had gone through after their mother's death, but Dean assured him that it didn't matter anymore. Following the clues in the drawing, they found an elderly lady who told them that the missing boy in the picture was her son, Peter, who had disappeared without a trace 35 years ago. The old lady had suffered greatly from this loss. Dean discovered that Peter and Bill were childhood friends. The brothers believed that Bill had drowned his childhood friend in the lake, so Peter's spirit sought revenge by killing Bill's relatives and offsprings, making him experience the same pain as Peter's mother. This time, the brothers encountered a vengeful ghost who died of the murder. To seek revenge, it would kill the murderer and their relatives. Since it died in the water, water was its source of power. As they couldn't find the body, burning it wouldn't work against the ghost. Only when the murderer was killed would the ghost's resentment be appeased. When the brothers returned to the lake to find Bill, they discovered he had already gone to the center of the lake by boat, only to be capsized and killed by a mysterious force. The case should have been closed, but when they visited the police station again, the autistic child was clearly frightened and sought Dean's protection. Dean told the sheriff what they had witnessed, but they were ordered to leave town. Dean and Sam pretended to leave but returned, concerned for the autistic child. They were surprised to discover that the sheriff and Peter were also classmates in the past. Led by the autistic child, they found Peter's bicycle in the sheriff's backyard. 
Under the brothers' questioning, the sheriff admitted that he and Bill had accidentally drowned Peter and covered up their crime by hiding his bicycle and sinking his body to the bottom of the lake. The autistic child was lured to the lake by the ghost. Dean, Sam, and the others rushed to the lake, only to see the child being dragged into the water. The sheriff saw Peter's ghost staring coldly at him. The brothers jumped into the lake but couldn't find the autistic child. The sheriff walked into the water, begging Peter to take him instead and spare his grandson. Finally, the ghost dragged the sheriff into the water, and at the same time, Dean saved the autistic child. After the revenge, the ghost was finally at rest. After the incident, the autistic child returned to normal and no longer refused to interact with others. Andrea and her child said goodbye to Dean and Sam, and the brothers set off on their journey again. Later at the airport, a man is shown suffering from a fear of flying. His eyes are invaded by a mysterious black substance, and in an instant, he seems like a completely different person. Forty minutes after the plane takes off, the man astonishingly manages to force open the airplane door, causing the plane to crash and resulting in the deaths of many passengers. Out of 100 people on board, only seven survive. Suddenly, Dean receives a phone call from a bald man named Jerry, who he and Sam had helped a few years ago by getting rid of a mischievous poltergeist. Jerry asks for their help again in dealing with another supernatural event. During their conversation, Jerry mentions that their father had always praised Sam for being a brilliant student. Sam is surprised to learn that their usually stoic father had praised him in front of others. Jerry sought out Dean's help because his company's plane was involved in the supernatural accident, and it seemed to be within Dean's area of expertise. Jerry gives them a recording from the cockpit during the accident. Sam asks for the passenger list and their information, but the plane's wreckage is being guarded by the transportation committee and is unavailable. Tech-savvy Sam extracts a strange voice from the recording, saying that no one could survive the accident. The brothers suspect that a poltergeist may be responsible. Dean thinks that the poltergeist is unprofessional, considering that seven people survived. The two then visit one of the survivors, a man with mental illness, who was closest to the door that opened during the accident. After the accident, he voluntarily admitted himself to a mental hospital. Through the mentally ill man, they learn that it was a man with completely black eyes who opened the door, not a mechanical failure as stated in the accident report. The man with black eyes is actually the same possessed man as shown earlier. By visiting the man's wife, they can only confirm that he is an ordinary human being. Confused, the brothers decide to infiltrate the transportation committee. Dean and Sam put on their suits and, posing as agents from the National Security Department, confidently enter the storage facility where the plane wreckage is kept. Dean proudly shows off a homemade electromagnetic field detector, which he claims can sense paranormal activity. Sam mocks the device, saying it looks like a broken portable radio. Using the detector, Dean discovers a problem with the door handle and asks Sam to scrape off some strange material. He then sneakily wipes the sticky substance on Sam's hand, likely in retaliation for Sam's earlier mockery. Once again, the brothers manage to escape just before the real national security agents arrive. On the other side, one of the plane crash survivors, a pilot, is put under a flight test. Due to his anxiety from the previous accident, his eyes are also invaded by the mysterious black substance. Forty minutes into the flight, the pilot deliberately crashes the plane, meeting his chubby end. Jerry analyzes the strange material that Sam brought back and discovers that it's sulfur, a residue typically left behind by demonic possession. It seems they're dealing with a demon this time. Demons are a form of black, shapeless matter that possesses people with negative emotions, such as anxiety and fear. They're known to control a person's thoughts and actions, wreak havoc, and harvest death. They can also read minds. Once possessed, a person's eyes turn completely black. These demons fear water and react to the name of Jesus spoken in Latin. Their powers are even stronger when separated from a human body. To exorcise a demon, one must first detach it from its host and then recite an incantation to send it back to hell. Sam learns through research that demons have been controlling disasters behind the scenes, but they've never faced one before. Both brothers wish their father were with them. Upon learning of the pilot's death, Sam discovers that in the past decade there have been six plane crashes, all occurring 40 minutes after takeoff. The number 40 in the Bible represents death. According to the recorded information, the demon plans to kill all the survivors from the plane crashes, reminiscent of the movie Final Destination. 
To stop the demon's evil deeds, the brothers must prevent the survivors from boarding planes. All the other survivors have no flight plans except for a flight attendant who is scheduled to fly that night. Before the plane takes off, Dean tries but fails to persuade the flight attendant not to board the plane. For their hunting mission, Sam decides that they both have to board the plane, only to find out that Dean has a fear of flying and is shivering with fear. Sam can't help but laugh at Dean's embarrassed appearance. To prepare for the fight against the demon, Dean even bribes a security officer to bring a large bottle of holy water on board. Dean suspects that the flight attendant has been possessed by the demon, but after testing her with the name of Jesus, he admits that she is indeed calm and mentally stronger than the aerophobic Dean. The plane experiences some minor turbulence, and Dean nervously starts reciting incantations. Sam threatens Dean that if he doesn't calm down, he'll be possessed by the demon. Once Dean calms down a bit, Sam tells him that they've found an incantation to deal with the demon, and they need to drive the demon out of its host first, and then send it back to hell. With the help of an electromagnet detector, Dean discovers that the co-pilot is the one possessed by the demon. With assistance, they lure the co-pilot into the flight attendant's preparation room. As soon as he steps inside, Dean tapes his mouth shut and starts beating him up. Sam douses the co-pilot with holy water and begins reciting the incantation. During their struggle, the demon tears off the tape and taunts Sam with the painful death of his girlfriend. Sam hesitates for a moment before picking up his father's notebook and continues reciting the incantation. In the chaos, the notebook is kicked away and the demon leaves the co-pilot's smelly mouth. With the possession broken, the demon infiltrates the plane and causes it to go out of control. Amidst darkness and screams, Sam retrieves the notebook and keeps chanting the incantation to send the demon back to hell. Meanwhile, Dean clings to the cabin wall, screaming in terror and wetting his pants. Finally, the demon is sent back to hell, and the plane returns to normal, landing safely. Sam is troubled by the fact that the demon knew about his girlfriend, but Dean insists that it was just the demon's cunning trick. With the plane demon incident resolved, the brothers bid farewell to Jerry. They find out that their father's phone was set to voicemail mode, so anyone looking for their father could only call Dean's cell phone. Speechless, the brothers hit the road once more. The scene then shifts to Lily and two girls playing games at home. They decide to seek some excitement by summoning Bloody Mary. To their horror, they actually manage to summon her, causing Lily's father to be killed in front of a bathroom mirror, his eyes gouged out and blood everywhere. Upon hearing about the bizarre incident, the Winchesters rush to the scene. The brothers bribe a morgue attendant to get a look at the father's body and the autopsy report. They then pose as the father's colleagues and attend the funeral trying to gather information from the older sister of Lily who summoned Bloody Mary. The sister, a firm believer in science, insists that their father died from a stroke. However, Lily blames herself for bringing Bloody Mary upon them. After comforting Lily, Dean and Sam secretly investigate the bathroom where her father was killed. They are discovered by Lily and her sister's friend Charlie, who exposes their true identities. Sam confesses that they are investigating the supernatural events, leaving their contact information with Charlie. It seems that Bloody Mary is responsible, but there are over 50 different versions of the Bloody Mary legend. Some say she was a witch, while others claim she was a murdered bride. They won't be able to stop her without figuring out which version is true, and it feels like searching for a needle in a haystack. Fortunately, all versions point to a woman named Mary, who died in front of a mirror. Unfortunately, the brothers have to rely on their own memory and paper records, as all the computers in the town have crashed. Charlie calls her curious friend to share her encounter with the Winchesters. The friend is also a believer in science, and to scare Charlie, she shouts, Bloody Mary, three times into a mirror. As expected, the friend meets the same fate as Lily's father, dying in front of the mirror. Sam has been having nightmares about his girlfriend's death. Dean has searched every local lead about Mirrors and Mary, but has found nothing. There are no other similar incidents besides the man's death. Just as they're discussing this, Charlie calls to inform them about her friend's death. With Charlie's help, Dean and Sam sneak into the friend's room and find an invisible handprint and a name on her mirror. After researching, they discover that the name belongs to a boy that Charlie's friend had accidentally killed in the past. On the father's mirror, they find the name of Lily's mother. Unable to find any Mary in the town, Dean manages to get a laptop and hacks into the FBI database to search for any Mary who died in front of a mirror. They eventually find a girl named Mary who was murdered 35 years ago in another town. Her eyes were gouged out and she left a bloody handprint and an unfinished name on the mirror before dying. 
Now that they know who she is, they try to figure out how to deal with her. They can't burn her body because Mary's body has already been cremated. So they have to appease her by taking down her killer. But the suspected killer is long dead. The brothers must find a new way to eliminate her. On the other side, Charlie explains the Bloody Mary legend to Lily's sister, who is quite skeptical. She decides to test the legend by summoning Bloody Mary in front of a mirror, but nothing happens. Charlie becomes terrified. Bloody Mary thrives on fear and quickly targets Charlie, who starts seeing the ghost in any reflective surface coming towards her. Desperate for help, she calls Sam and Dean and locks herself inside her house, staying away from reflective surfaces and trembling with her pants wetted. While discussing Mary's case in the car, Sam and Dean discovered that the mirror connected to her recently ended up in an antique shop in the town where Lily's family live. They piece together information about mirrors and legends and finally get an idea of the ghost they're dealing with. This Bloody Mary is a mirror ghost. Having died in front of a mirror, her soul was absorbed by it. As Mary was murdered, when summoned as Bloody Mary, she manifests and kills the summoner or anyone nearby who feels guilty about taking a life. The ghost probably thinks it's avenging, but it's irrational and cannot distinguish between the actual killers and those who simply feel responsible. Sam and Dean decide their best bet is to lure it back to its original mirror and then break it to an end. They comfort the frightened Charlie, and Sam decides to summon Bloody Mary himself, as he's been haunted by the death of his girlfriend, making him a prime target for Mary. Dean disagrees, but eventually gives in to his stubborn brother. That night, the brothers sneak into the antique shop filled with mirrors, a perfect lair for Bloody Mary. Sam finds Mary's mirror and tries to summon her, while Dean is called outside by the police. As soon as Dean leaves, Sam hears strange noises and starts smashing suspicious mirrors. Mary appears in a mirror in front of Sam, but luckily Dean fights off the police and returns in time, breaking the mirror and temporarily resolving the crisis. The brothers try to leave, but the mirror ghost crawls out of the mirror frame like a creepy, vengeful spirit. The brothers are immobilized by Mary's power and struggle on the slick floor. Dean grabs a nearby mirror and places it in front of Mary, forcing her to confront her own reflection. She realizes she has killed many innocent people and ultimately destroys herself, dissolving into a pool of blood. Having dealt with Bloody Mary, the brothers say goodbye to Charlie. They learn from the mirror ghost's words that Sam had a premonition of his girlfriend's death, but didn't tell her or Dean. Sam blames himself for not warning her in time. The brothers briefly touch on the subject before setting off once more on their journey, accompanied by the intro music of Daniel C.C. Movie Channel. Afterwards, Sam receives a call for help from a college friend, Rebecca. It turns out that her brother is accused of killing his fiance. The police have a video of Rebecca's brother at the crime scene at the time of the murder. However, Rebecca claims that her brother was drinking with her all night, so it's impossible for him to be in two places at once. Since the murder, the dogs in the neighborhood have become aggressive and irritable, suggesting a supernatural presence. After watching the crime scene footage, Sam notices that Rebecca's brother's eyes are eerily white with tiny pupils. That same night, a man is seen beating his wife, and then another identical man enters the house. Clearly, the man assaulting the woman is an imposter. The two cases lead Dean to believe that they're dealing with a shapeshifter, a creature capable of changing their appearance, such as skinwalkers and werewolves. This particular shapeshifter was born in human form, but is hideous. Shapeshifters typically take on the appearance of their target and, after transforming, can access the target's memories and thoughts. The only difference from human beings is that their eyes sometimes turn white with small pupils. By investigating the monster's escape route, Dean discovers that the shapeshifter uses the sewer system to move around and commit crimes. Inside the sewer, they find a pile of discarded skin, suggesting that the creature must shed its skin to transform. To defeat the shapeshifter, they need to shoot its heart with a silver bullet. Armed with guns loaded with silver bullets, the brothers venture into the sewers to hunt down the shapeshifter. After some time, they find its lair, but Dean is injured by the creature. Sam tries to chase it down, but loses its trail. The brothers split up to search for the shapeshifter, but to no avail. They regroup only for Sam to realize that the Dean he has met up with is actually the shapeshifter in disguise. Sam recognizes the imposter, despite the shapeshifter's perfect mimicry of Dean's memories. However, Sam is overpowered by the creature and taken back to its lair. When Sam regains consciousness, he demands to know where the real Dean is. The shapeshifter, using its mind-reading ability, attempts to torment Sam with Dean's memories and thoughts. It turns out that deep down, Dean is a scared, lonely child who dreams of having a happy united family. 
However, Sam left their father and their life together to pursue his own dreams, leaving Dean feeling abandoned. The shapeshifter then shamelessly admits that it finds Rebecca hot and attractive before leaving to meet her. Meanwhile, Dean is also being held captive in the shapeshifter's lair. The brothers work together to free themselves and set out to rescue Rebecca. On the other side, the shapeshifter uses Dean's appearance to flirt with Rebecca. However, she doesn't fall for its bad hormones. Angered, the shapeshifter ties her up, beats her, and tries to kill her. The police arrive just in time to chase the shapeshifter away. As a result, Dean is accused of the crime and makes the headlines. This shapeshifter is truly twisted, taking on a man's appearance to assault women and commit murder. It's the most despicable monster they've encountered so far. Since Dean is now a wanted man, he and Sam have to split up. After helping Dean evade the police, Sam finds Rebecca, who seems unharmed despite the recent attack. Meanwhile, Dean investigates the shapeshifter's lair on his own and finds the real Rebecca, who is still held captive. It becomes clear that the current Rebecca with Sam is actually the shapeshifter. The shapeshifter kidnaps Sam and takes on Dean's appearance, intending to kill Sam and make it look like fratricide. Despite putting up a good fight, Sam is eventually overpowered. Just as he is about to be killed, the real Dean arrives in the nick of time and shoots the shapeshifter dead with two silver bullets. The police later identify the dead shapeshifter as the real perpetrator of the previous crimes. With their names cleared, the Winchester brothers continue on their journey. After the ordeal with his college friend, Sam realizes that he might not be suited for a normal life. Dean, however, jokes that their life is interesting, as not many people get to attend their own funeral. Elsewhere, a girl named Lori dresses up in a sexy outfit for a date with her boyfriend. They drive to a secluded location where her boyfriend suggests they get intimate. Lori hesitates possibly because there might be some peeping toms in the wilderness. Suddenly, they're interrupted by a piercing noise. Her boyfriend goes to investigate and is killed by an unknown assailant, hung from a tree and impaled by a hook. Dean and Sam, unable to locate their father, suspect he's deliberately hiding his whereabouts. They decide to follow the news of mysterious deaths, believing their father will be wherever monsters are. Later, they come across the news of Lori's boyfriend's death and manage to infiltrate the university she attends by posing as fraternity members. At the memorial service for Lori's boyfriend, they learn that Lori's father is a priest. Sam inquires about the details of the night, and as always, the handsome brothers are able to gather information quickly from attractive women. After discussing the case with Dean, they debate whether the monster is Hookman or some other poltergeist. With no other choice, they head to the library to research related information. They discover an old article about a pastor who was accused of murder. The crime scene matches the location where Lori's boyfriend was killed. Moreover, the pastor lost one hand in an accident and replaced it with a silver hook, hence earning him a nickname, Hook Man. The two brothers arrive at the scene where Lori's boyfriend died. This time, Dean brings out a new weapon, a gun loaded with salt pellets. Previously, their father and Dean had discovered that salt has a restraining effect on ghosts and monsters. However, the brothers are caught by patrolling detectives and, looking guilty with their guns, are taken into custody at the police station. Meanwhile, Lori's best friend Lady Bro encourages her again to attend a girl's wild party, but her priest father disapproves. After arguing with her father, Lori returns to her dorm to find Lady Bro asleep. Being considerate, she doesn't turn on the light and finishes her nightly routine in the dark. The next morning, she finds Lady Bro dead in bed, covered in blood. On the wall, a chilling message reads, Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Dean manages to convince the detectives that their salt-loaded guns were part of a prank, as no sane person would load a gun with salt. They're released, only to learn about the murder of Lady Bro. The brothers sneak into the crime scene and find the same symbol from the pastor's silver hook in a corner. They conclude that they're dealing with the ghost of Hookman. It's revealed that he openly opposed moral corruption and killed 13 prostitutes with his hook. Some victims were found in bed, their sheets stained with blood, while others were hung from tree branches to display their sins. Knowing it's a ghost, they plan to find the remains, salt them, and burn them. However, they wonder why Hookman's ghost was summoned. Sam's research reveals that, over the years, religious figures in the town have committed murders opposing moral corruption. The perpetrators claim to be controlled by a mysterious force. Sam thinks both victims were connected to Lori, and that her father, the priest, summoned Hookman. Dean, on the other hand, believes Hookman's ghost may be lurking in the priest's repressed emotions, rather than a deliberate summoning. Regardless, their priority is to eliminate Hookman. The brothers split up for the mission. Sam watches over Lori and her father, while Dean digs up graves and burns remains. 
Dean finally finds Hookman's grave, complaining that next time he'll watch the beautiful girl while Sam does the dirty work. He successfully burns Hookman's remains, but Sam learns from Lori that her father had an affair with a married woman. She then embraces Sam and tries to kiss him, but Sam stops her tongue in time. The priest goes to find his daughter, only to be attacked by Hookman. Sam uses his salt gun to repel the ghost, but the priest ends up in the intensive care unit. When Dean returns, Sam tells him they were both wrong. Hookman was actually lurking in Lori's emotions. Her boyfriend wanted to have sex before marriage. Lady Bro tried to lead her astray, and her father preached morality while cheating with a married woman. This made Lori feel repressed and resentful, giving Hookman the chance to strike. Though they had burned Hookman's remains, the ghost was still around. Sam suggests that the Hook was also part of Hookman and the source of his power. They must find and destroy the Hook to eliminate Hookman once and for all. The two brothers delve into the research once again and discover that after Hookman's death, all his belongings were collected and hidden in the church where Lori's father is the priest. The Hook had been melted down and turned into other items. The brothers gather all the silver objects from the church and Lori's home and throw them into the fireplace. Suddenly, Sam realizes that Lori has returned to the church. She confesses her sins, believing that she summoned the avenging angel from the Bible and hurt her boyfriend, Ladybro, and even her father. Her confession, however, attracts Hookman. Dean arrives just in time, using salt to temporarily repel Hookman. At that moment, Sam notices that Lori's pendant is also made of silver from the church. He quickly removes it and gives it to Dean to burn. Finally, they manage to destroy the seemingly unkillable Hookman. The mysterious case comes to an end, and the brothers must leave and hit the road once more. Somewhere in Oklahoma, a group of workers labor in an upscale residential area. Two of the workers complain that they could never afford to buy a house here. One worker accidentally falls into a hole and is surrounded by a swarm of insects. By the time he's rescued, his brain has been devoured. Sam and Dean continue their monster-hunting lifestyle, relying on gambling and credit card fraud to meet their basic needs. They engage in a small rant, with Dean saying he doesn't care. Moving past this everyday topic, the brothers discuss the strange death of the worker, suspecting supernatural involvement. After questioning the workers who were present during the incident, Sam and Dean visit the scene of the crime. Their search yields few results, only finding some beetles. Dean suggests they ask around at a local gathering place where they can also score a free meal. The brothers pose as potential home buyers to gain entrance to a party, but they're mistaken for a couple. They discover that the developer's son, Matt, has a fascination with insects. The strained father-son relationship reminds Sam of his own relationship with his father. Dean uncovers a previous incident where the worker was killed by insects. So far, they haven't found any evidence of a ghost, and the only connection to the case is the insects. That night, the sales manager of the upscale residential area is attacked by insects and killed while taking a naked bath at home. The next day, the brothers sneak into the sales manager's house, finding many spiders at the scene. They suspect Matt controlled the insects to commit murder. Upon locating Matt, they discover he's just a boy who loves studying insects. He tells the brothers that, although he's not involved in the murder, his research indicates something odd is happening with the insects in the area. He takes them to see the bizarre insects in the forest, where they find clumps of intertwined earthworms. Dean retrieves a skull from the pile of worms. The brothers take the skull to a university professor who specializes in local customs. During their investigation, Sam and Dean argue about their father, with Sam believing that his dad was never satisfied with him and forced him to become a demon hunter rather than a hormone hunter. Dean, however, tells Sam that even when he left home to attend college, their father secretly watched over him from a distance, always concerned for his safety, not as cold as Sam thought. The professor doesn't provide a direct answer, but suggests that the brothers consult with the local indigenous people. It turns out that they're not dealing with a demon, but rather a curse that harnesses the power of nature. They learn from the indigenous descendants that the upscale residential area where the murders occurred was once the home of a native tribe. White colonizers invaded the area, killing all the tribe's members. Before dying, the tribal leader cursed the land, stating that any white person who tried to claim it would be repelled by nature's forces and would only find misery and death. The insects are the manifestation of nature's forces in the curse. Because the colonizers took six days to annihilate the tribe, the curse would cause sporadic deaths in the first five days and then wipe out all white people in the area on the sixth day. 
Sam and Dean are at a loss when it comes to breaking the curse. Realizing that the first insect-related murder occurred five days ago, they know the sixth day is upon them. There's no way to break the curse, so the brothers try to get the developer and his family to leave the residential area. However, the developer refuses to believe them and doesn't want to go. Sam and Dean fail to convince the stubborn developer. Before they can resolve the situation, an army of insects appears, swarming from all directions, causing the group to seek refuge in a house. When they try to call for help, the insects cut off the power and lines. The developer's family is terrified and Sam reassures them that they'll be safe once the sun rises. To fend off the insects, Dean finds some insecticide. The insects soon break into the house and Dean sprays the insecticide to repel wave after wave of them. The group of five is forced to retreat to the attic, where Dean continues to battle the insects. Sam tries to plug the holes they're coming through, and the developer protects his wife and child. They endure a long, harrowing night. As the sun comes up, the insect army retreats, and the five people survive. The ordeal brings Matt closer to his father, and Sam gains a new perspective on his relationship with his own dad. It's a reminder that even though fathers may seem critical and uncommunicative, they will protect their children when it matters most. Dean and Sam's journey to find their father resumes. Sam woke up from a nightmare, but this time it wasn't about his girlfriend. Instead, it was a woman banging on the window for help, which made him anxious. He discovered that the house the woman lived in was their childhood home in Kansas. Sam asked Dean to visit their childhood home next. Dean was reluctant to return to the old house where they lost their mother as it was a painful memory for him. However, he eventually gave in to his brother's persuasion. Upon returning to the old house, they found it was now inhabited by a single mother, Jenny, and her two children. Jenny welcomed them after learning that they were the previous owners and mentioned that the house was fine, except for some strange noises and flickering lights. Her daughter told Sam about a fiery figure appearing in her closet. Both brothers became emotional and argued, with Dean wanting to leave the house quickly, while Sam suspected an evil spirit and wanted to help the family. The thing the girl mentioned might be the culprit behind harming their mother and Sam's girlfriend years ago. Eventually, they forced themselves to calm down and focused on resolving the issue within the house. This led Dean to recall the traumatic scene of the fire from their childhood. Sam learned for the first time that Dean had saved him as a baby from the burning house. The brothers had no clue about the identity of their mother's killer, and their father never told them either. They had to dig deeper into the past to uncover the truth. Sam worried about Dean's mental state, but Dean insisted he was fine and avoided the topic. Sam called their father and left a message about their visit to the old house and the strange occurrences, hoping he would come to help. Dean, with tears in his eyes, displayed a vulnerability he had never shown before, like the helpless boy who had just lost his mother over 20 years ago. The brothers asked their father's former neighbors about the situation 20 years prior and found their father's old medium friend named Miss Psychic through his notebook. She had guided their father onto the path of a demon hunter. Miss Psychic was a humorous, occasionally teasing Dean. Meanwhile, strange incidents continued to happen at the old house, such as a worker's arm being severed by an unknown force while fixing a pipe, and Jenny's young son being trapped in a cold refrigerator by a mysterious power. Dean and Sam brought Miss Psychic to the old house, and Dean took out a ghost detector, only to be teased by her for being unprofessional. Miss Psychic pointed out that the house was still enveloped by dark forces and Sam's childhood nursery was the source. But the entity causing trouble in the house was not the one that killed their mother. Miss Psychic revealed that it wasn't just one entity, but many strange forces gathered in the house, all targeting the family. The reason they encountered various ghosts over the years was because a mysterious force had left a trace on them, attracting ghosts like a beacon. The old house was no exception, now attracting a malevolent spirit. It turned out that the main occupant of the old house this time was an evil spirit with no connection to the house itself, so there was no mention of finding remains or appeasing resentment. At this moment, Miss Psychic demonstrated her psychic professionalism. She provided a lot of materials and instructed Dean to create exorcism packets. By placing these packets in every corner of the house, they would be able to eliminate the evil spirits along with any other strange forces, making the old house clean. Miss Psychic escorted Jenny and her family out of the house. The trio had to puncture holes in the walls to place the exorcism packets inside. But the strange forces wouldn't let go of those who threatened their existence. 
During the process, Miss Psychic and Dean managed to avoid danger, but Sam was nearly killed, looking weak and vulnerable. Fortunately, Dean arrived just in time to save him. Once the exorcism packets were in place, a bright white light filled the house, and the strange occurrences ceased. Although it seemed like the strange forces had been driven out, Sam remained uneasy. He and Dean decided to keep watch outside the old house overnight. As expected, the scene from Sam's nightmare came true. Dean rescued Jenny to the ground. However, Sam was captured by the evil spirit. Frantic, Dean rushed back into the house to save Sam, who had been severely tormented by the evil spirit. Just then, the figure engulfed in flames appeared. Dean assumed it was the evil spirit, but it turned out to be the ghost of their mother. Dean gazed at her gentle face with fond memories, and she tenderly called out the names of Dean and Sam. This was the first time Sam had seen his mother aside from photographs. In the end, the mother apologized to Sam and in order to protect her children confronted the evil spirit. She saved her children by sacrificing her own soul to destroy the evil spirit, making the house completely safe. Miss Psychic pointed out that Sam had the ability to sense ghosts, but couldn't explain the reason. Eventually, the brothers bid farewell to Miss Psychic and left the sentimental place. Miss Psychic returned to her own home and mumbled to herself that Sam has a strong power, but he can't sense his own father. As she turned around, she saw Dean and Sam's father, John, unexpectedly sitting on her sofa. He hadn't sought out his sons, nor could he show himself, not even to the ghost of his wife. Silently, he twirled his wedding ring, a puzzling act considering how much he loved her. The brothers asked many people who knew their father, but they couldn't find any information about his whereabouts. Sam even suspected that their father might have died in some small corner. Just as the brothers were about to argue, Dean received a set of coordinates on his phone, one of their father's old tricks. Dean found local news about a police officer who, after patrolling an abandoned asylum, went home, killed his wife, and terminated himself. Their father's notebook had marked this asylum where multiple murders had occurred in the past. Sam was dissatisfied with their father's approach, but Dean told him that if it was their father's request, he would carry it out without hesitation. The brothers played a trick to get information from the said officer's partner, who revealed that the officer's death was not a suicide. During the day, the brothers sneaked into the abandoned asylum to investigate. The asylum was actually a mental hospital, and the previous news about the murders pointed to a room in the asylum. It seemed that anyone who entered the room went mad and eventually died. In the empty asylum, Dean jokingly compared Sam's psychic abilities to a ghost detector, but Sam solemnly retorted that he could only have prophetic dreams. The ghost detector showed no reaction, probably because ghosts didn't appear during the day. Apart from some horrifying medical instruments and a doctor's nameplate, the brothers found no other clues. Sam then pretended to be a patient in need of mental treatment and got information from the son of the asylum's former director. It turned out that there had been a riot at the asylum long ago, with patients revolting and some bodies never found, including the asylum's director. Since then, the asylum had been abandoned. Having found nothing during the day, the brothers decided to investigate again at night. Before the brothers arrived at the asylum, a thrill-seeking couple went there to play an adventure game and, of course, encountered ghosts. When Dean and Sam finally arrived, the atmosphere at night was quite different from during the day. The ghost detector's red light never went out. To deal with the ghosts, they had to find the bodies and burn them. However, this time they had to deal with mentally ill ghosts, which were more unpredictable. Sam discovered that the ghosts here didn't seem to have any intention of attacking. The brothers met the girl from the thrill-seeking couple, and Dean decided to split up with Sam to find the boy. Sam found the frightened boy who had been scared unconscious while the girl was locked in a room by a ghost. Sam rushed over to comfort the girl using his words, but not muscles, and listened to what the ghost was saying. The ghost provided a room number, so Sam took the couple out of the asylum while Dean went to find the room. Dean found the diary of the former director of the asylum and discovered that he had conducted brain experiments on the patients, trying to cure them by releasing their anger. However, things went awry and he was killed by the enraged patients. At this point, Sam realized that they couldn't leave the asylum because it was sealed. Just then, Dean called for help, asking Sam to go to the basement. Sam left the salt gun with the couple and went to find Dean. As expected, this was a trick by the ghost of the director, who then controlled Sam and released his anger. Under its control, Sam shot Dean with the salt gun, but Dean managed to knock Sam out. Afterward, Dean found the secret room in the basement where the director had conducted human experiments years ago. The missing director's body was hidden in a cabinet. Dean sprinkled salt and poured oil on the body. 
As the director's body was set on fire, his haunting soul also turned to ashes. Sam regained consciousness, and the brothers bid farewell to the reckless couple. Sam and Dean stayed up all night and just wanted to go back to the hotel to sleep. While fast asleep, the phone rang. Sam answered the call. Their father, who had been missing for six months, finally contacted the brothers. Sam was thrilled to receive his father's call and kept asking where he was, but he got a cold response from their father. John already had information on the murderer of their mother, but in order to protect the brothers' safety, he refused to meet with them and kept assigning them the task of exterminating ghosts. Although Dean wanted to help their father find the murderer, he obediently noted down the information for their new assignment and set off for the mission immediately. Sam, however, thought their father was unreasonable. Now he just wanted to find their father and take out their mother's murderer. Sam also criticized Dean for being their father's yes-man. The two brothers had a big fight and went their separate ways. Dean followed their father's clues to kill the monster, while Sam went off to find their father. After the fight, both brothers wanted to call each other. However, neither was willing to be the first to show weakness. Dean arrived at the address their father provided. The case this time involved a couple that had disappeared on the same road on the same day each year, a pattern that had continued for many years. The day for this year's couple to disappear was fast approaching. Dean discovered an orchard nearby. The ghost detector had a strong reaction to this place. There was a terrifying scarecrow in the orchard, and on the grassland, there was a piece of human skin with a tattoo. It seemed that the previous couple's disappearances were all related to this scarecrow. In the town, Dean struck up a conversation with a young lady named Emily and learned that she had come to the village to seek refuge with her uncle and aunt. The farms and orchards around the town had disappeared, but this small town seemed blessed and had remained peaceful. In a restaurant, Dean spotted a passing couple who seemed to be the next victims. Dean tried to tell them that the town was suspicious. However, the couple thought he was a pervert, and the restaurant owner called the police, driving Dean out of the town. On the other hand, Sam coincidentally met a blonde girl named Meg twice. The two chatted and found common ground as both had run away from home due to their overbearing and oppressive families. In the evening, Dean sneaked back into the town just in time to see the scarecrow trying to kill the couple he had met earlier in the day. Dean confronted the scarecrow and protected the couple, helping them escape safely. Convinced that the scarecrow was behind it all, Dean called Sam to discuss what kind of monster they were dealing with and hesitantly admitted that he needed Sam's help. The brothers apologized to each other for their previous fight. Dean even praised Sam for having a self-aware approach to life. Later, Dean sought the help of a professor. After discussing his theories, he finally understood the nature of the creature they were dealing with. It turned out that the Scarecrow was not a ghost, but a pagan god from the Norse pantheon, known as Vanir. This deity could bless the local agriculture, and in return, the believers were required to erect a statue of Vanir in their fields and offer a living male and female as human sacrifices each year. The god's image was that of a scarecrow, and its power came from a sacred tree. To defeat the pagan god, they needed to burn down the sacred tree. Just as Dean received this info from the professor, he was knocked out by the town's police. It seemed that everyone in the town was a follower of Vanir. The god was angry because the previous night's sacrifice had not been successful. To appease its wrath, the townspeople decided to offer Dean as a sacrifice. They still needed a female sacrifice, so Emily was pushed forward by her aunt and uncle. When confronted by Emily, her aunt unashamedly claimed it was for the god. Meanwhile, Sam sensed something was wrong and feared his brother was in danger. He refused Meg's attempts to keep him around and set off to find his brother. Dean learned from Emily that the sacred tree was in the orchard. Coincidentally, they were both tied up in the orchard. Night fell, and Dean still hadn't found a way to escape. Luckily, Sam arrived just in time to rescue Dean and Emily. At that moment, the Scarecrow came back to life. The trio tried to flee, but were surrounded by the townspeople. Emily's uncle was the first to be attacked by the Scarecrow and became a sacrifice. Shortly after, her aunt was also sacrificed. With the sacrifices complete, Dean, Sam, and Emily were finally safe. The next day, the brothers destroyed the sacred tree in the orchard, hoping that no more evil cults like this would bring harm to people. The scene shifts to the brothers using high-voltage electricity to fight a monster. However, Dean and the monster both stood in the same body of water. As the monster was electrocuted, Dean was also injured. His heart was damaged, and he had only a few weeks left to live. Sam couldn't accept his brother's impending death and searched everywhere for a way to save him, whether scientific or supernatural. 
Through their father's friend, Sam took Dean to a doctor said to be able to cure all diseases. It turned out to be a preacher who ran a faith-based healing organization built on a muddy site. Dean was initially skeptical, but changed his attitude after meeting a beautiful woman, Layla. The blind preacher told his followers that they could be healed if they believed in God. Dean, who had seen many ghosts but never God, scoffed at this idea. However, the blind preacher chose to treat Dean's illness. Placing his hands on Dean's head and with the prayers of his followers, Dean fell to the ground and his heart damage was miraculously healed. As his vision blurred, Dean saw a terrifying figure beside the preacher. While Sam was overjoyed that his brother was cured, Dean felt something was off. But at the same time as Dean's healing, a healthy athlete died from a heart disease. The two brothers split up, with Dean trying to get information from the preacher. The preacher had once been gravely ill but recovered through prayers to God. The preacher then gained the ability to heal others. Meanwhile, Sam investigated the athlete's case and found that something was amiss. When the athlete died, his watch stopped at the exact time of his death. Dean also learned that Layla had a brain tumor and only the preacher could save her. Sam researched further and discovered that whenever the preacher healed someone, someone else in the town would die. It was a life-for-life -life healing method. Sam felt sorry about it but didn't regret it happening to save Dean. The brothers discussed that they were likely dealing with the Grim Reaper rather than a ghost. The brothers rushed to the blind preacher's gathering. Dean tried to stall the preacher's healing ritual while Sam sneaked into the preacher's house to look for information. Sam found a notebook documenting a method to summon the Grim Reaper and a list of previous victims. At the gathering, Layla was chosen to be healed, and the one to die in her place was a skeptic who never believed in the preacher. Although Dean wanted Layla to be healed, he had to disrupt the ritual due to his responsibility. He discovered that the one controlling the Grim Reaper was not the blind preacher, but his wife, Anne. Since the healing was interrupted, the preacher had to perform the ritual on Layla again. Anne chose Dean, who discovered her identity, to be the next victim. Luckily, Sam found information on how to confront the Grim Reaper from the notebook. It turned out that the Grim Reaper this time was the death card from the tarot. Dark sorcerers used bones and human blood to create dark altars, capturing the Grim Reaper. They compelled the Reaper to kill on their behalf. The Reaper could stop time, but only those near death could see it. The solution was to destroy the altar and break the curse, freeing the Reaper. As night fell, the two brothers split up once again. Sam searched for Anne, while Dean attracted others' attention. Dean lured the crowd away, but encountered the Grim Reaper. Fortunately, Sam arrived at the altar in time, destroying Anne's curse and saving Dean's life. The liberated Reaper wouldn't spare those who enslaved it. Anne was taken away as soon as it was released. Although the incident was over, Dean remained unhappy. After all, he survived at the expense of others' lives, and Layla couldn't live because of the Reaper's departure. Nevertheless, Layla optimistically consoled Dean, allowing him to let go of his worries. After that, the scene shifts to the brothers discussing their next destination, when Dean received a call for help from a former lover, Cassie, who had lost her father and her father's friend in consecutive car accidents. The cars showed signs of impact, but only one vehicle's tracks were found on the road. Before dying, the victims mentioned being followed by a terrifying black truck with no driver inside. The police ultimately ruled it an accident, but Cassie suspected supernatural forces were at play. When faced with this situation, she requested Dean's help. When the brothers inquired about the situation, they met her mother, a white woman. Not long after, the same kind of accident happened again, this time claiming the life of another friend of Cassie's father. All the victims so far had been Afro-Americans and died on the same stretch of road. Cassie wanted to close off the accident-prone road, but the mayor disagreed, as it was the only main road in and out of the small town. She accused the mayor of racial discrimination, as he didn't seem to care about the Afro-Americans' victims. The mayor, however, hinted that Cassie's mother could prove he wasn't that kind of person. The brothers posed as insurance agents, asking the victims' colleagues if they had seen a black truck. They learned that, in the 1960s, the Afro-Americans had been taken away by black trucks, never to be heard from again. At that time, the town's residents were most hostile towards Afro-Americans, and their lives were considered worthless. Even the police wouldn't seriously investigate Afro-Americans' fates. One evening, Dean met with Cassie, and they didn't talk about serious matters for long before they started arguing about their past breakup. Their love had ended due to a misunderstanding, and now that it had been cleared up, they quickly made up. 
However, the night passed, and the white mayor unexpectedly became the next victim, breaking the pattern of only Afro-Americans' victims. Furthermore, he did not die on the highway. Sam and Dean then discovered that this case, including the previous disappearance of Afro-Americans, seemed to be related to a guy, Dorian, from the 1960s who had gone missing. At this point, Cassie saw the terrifying black truck at her home and immediately called Dean for help. The brothers arrived just in time and the black truck disappeared. Under Dean's questioning, Cassie's mother revealed the past. Back then, she had broken up with Dorian and chosen Cassie's father, an Afro-American. Dorian, angered, started targeting Afro-Americans people with his truck, killing them. Cassie's parents had planned to marry, setting a date and choosing a church. However, on the wedding day, Dorian set the church on fire, unaware that Cassie's parents didn't go to the church, but all the children in the choir inside were burned to death. Afterward, Dorian became even more ruthless, trying to kill Cassie's father, but was killed instead. His body, along with the black truck, was pushed into a swamp by Cassie's father and his friends to destroy the evidence. The mayor had found proof of Cassie's father's crime, but due to Dorian's past actions, let him go. It turned out that Dorian's spirit possessed the truck. The mayor had previously reformed the swamp, disturbing Dorian's spirit who was resting in the swamp. The usual method of dealing with spirits was to sprinkle salt and burn everything related to the spirit. The brothers dug up the truck and Dorian's body from the swamp, intending to burn them. However, it was useless. Dean was chased by the black truck, and Sam directed him to stop on the land of the church that had been burned down years ago. The black truck crashed into Dean and finally vanished into thin air. It turned out that the church's land was sacred. Even if the church was damaged, its sacred nature was indestructible and could still purify the spirits. Sam wasn't sure about this property when Dean was fleeing for his life. Now that Dean had escaped, Sam had verified this theory. Dean was upset as his life had been used as an experiment. The ghost truck accident was resolved, and although Dean and Cassie rekindled their old feelings, they still broke up in the end. After all, Dean needed to continue hunting demons with Sam. The brothers drove away once more, continuing their journey. Sam dreamt of a tragic man, Max, killed in his car by a mysterious force. Upon waking up, he urged Dean to drive to the scene of the incident, but they still couldn't prevent the tragedy from happening. Dean had previously comforted Sam, saying it was just a nightmare. But this time, Sam had a premonition about a stranger, which shocked Dean as well. This time, the two disguised themselves as priests to attend the funeral, but they didn't get any useful information from Max's wife or his son, Roger. There were no signs of ghosts or monsters at their current residence and land. One evening, Sam suddenly had a splitting headache and without even falling asleep, saw Max's brother being killed by a window. Sam was confused and afraid of his newfound precognitive abilities. Just as he had predicted, Max's brother met his fate. Sam guessed that Max's family was cursed and joked that his own family was cursed as well. Dean argued that their family was just a little unlucky. The brothers disguised themselves as priests once more and talked to Max's son, Roger. They found out that he was afraid of the old house the family used to live in. Dean and Sam went to the old house and learned about Roger's miserable childhood. It turns out Max and his brother constantly abused Roger, which explained his frail appearance. Roger's biological mother was already dead, and his stepmother coldly watched as Roger suffered. At this point, Sam had another splitting headache and had a vision of Roger controlling a knife from a distance to kill his stepmother in revenge for her indifference. Dean wanted to stop the boy, but Sam wanted to talk to him, as he was taking revenge rather than being a psychopathic killer. However, Roger discovered Dean's hidden gun, used his powers to take it, and knocked out his stepmother. Sam managed to calm the boy down using his persuasive words and learned from their conversation that Roger had grown up in a violent environment. He had been beaten up by Max not long ago and couldn't escape the shadow of the abuse. During their conversation, Sam discovered that Roger's biological mother had died in the same way as Sam's own mother. This revelation shocked and excited Sam. Also, Roger had gained his telekinetic powers around the same time as Sam had acquired his precognitive abilities, half a year ago. After that, Roger locked Sam in a closet and blocked the door with a bookcase, determined to kill his stepmother. While in the closet, Sam had another vision that the boy would kill Dean. Sam couldn't accept his beloved brother getting killed and miraculously used his own telekinesis to move the bookcase and stop the boy just in time. Roger failed to kill anyone but couldn't escape the shadow of abuse either, so he ended his own life. 
Roger's death saddened Sam, who was grateful that his own father hadn't been like Max. Sam told Dean that he had not only precognitive abilities, but also telekinetic powers, which made him anxious and feel like a monster. Dean reassured him that he wouldn't become a monster as long as he was there. On the surface, Dean didn't seem to care, but when Sam couldn't see him, Dean showed a worried expression. Afterward, the two brothers arrived in a small town, posing as detectives investigating a missing person case. The eyewitness was a young boy who said that a man had been dragged away by something strange from under a car. Sam suspected it might be a ghost kidnapping people. The two decided to rest at a hotel, and during Dean's trip to the restroom, Sam inexplicably vanished. Dean became anxious about his brother's disappearance. He sought help from the local police, revealing his identity as an international detective. A female police officer took on the case. While researching Sam's information, she surprisingly discovered that Dean was a murderer. Fortunately, Dean had disguised his name and avoided exposure. Dean and Miss Officer reviewed surveillance footage and found a suspicious license plate, suggesting the case might not be related to ghosts after all. Meanwhile, Sam awoke to find himself locked in a cage alongside the previously missing man. It seemed they were imprisoned by humans, not ghosts. Dean and Miss Officer followed the surveillance information, tracking the suspicious vehicle. Miss Officer saw through Dean's fake identity and attempted to arrest him. Dean claimed his brother was in great danger. Miss Officer thought of her own brother who had gone missing three years ago and agreed to put her grievances with Dean aside until they found Sam. On the other side, Sam was trying to save himself when the man's cage suddenly opened. It was clearly a trap, but the man still tried to escape. Although he found a knife for self-defense, he was hunted down and killed by a deranged family on a rainy night. Miss Officer drove to the farm where they were being held, handcuffed Dean to the car, and went alone to investigate. She was deceived by an innocent-looking girl and knocked unconscious by the twisted family's father. Dean used his lock-picking skills to free himself and hid before the deranged family arrived. He discovered the location of Sam and Miss Officer, along with the cars of many other missing people, including Miss Officer's brother. Dean infiltrated the Twisted family's house to get the keys to Sam's cage, finding personal belongings and organs of the missing people displayed like trophies. Photos of the family with their dead victims were hung on the walls, like hunters posing with their prey. As Dean was caught stealing the keys, he was overpowered and tied up. The Twisted family's tradition was to hunt humans for fun, controlling their lives and reveling in their despair. The Twisted father forced Dean to choose their next victim, Sam or the officer. The family decided to kill Sam in the cage and release Miss Officer for their twisted hunt. However, Sam had cleverly opened the cage, and when the twisted brother entered the room, Sam and Miss Officer fought back and defeated the family members. Upon learning that Miss Officer's brother had also been hunted, she was enraged and killed the twisted father. Miss Officer eventually contacted the police, but Sam and Dean escaped before they arrived. Dean warned Sam not to disappear so easily in the future. Although they didn't encounter any ghosts this time, the experience was even more chilling, as the human is somehow more evil than a demon. The scene shifts to a young woman who was mysteriously killed by a shadowy figure in her home. This time, the brothers disguised themselves as employees of an alarm system company to enter the victim's house. Everything in the house was intact, except for the woman who was torn to shreds. Dean activated the ghost detector and discovered that the culprit was indeed a supernatural being. Through a flirtatious exchange with a female police officer, Dean learned that the victim's heart had been removed. Dean used black tape to connect the bloodstains left by the victim, forming a strange symbol. Meanwhile, Sam was visibly disgusted by his brother's behavior. Apart from the female victim, there was another victim, a man who had died in the same way. However, the two victims had no apparent connection. At that moment, Sam encountered the girl Meg, whom he had met before. Unaware of Meg's true identity, Sam enthusiastically caught up with her and even exchanged contact information. Dean cleverly saw through Sam's attempts to flirt, but Sam claimed he suspected Meg was up to something. Sam asked Dean to investigate the strange symbol and Meg's background, while he kept an eye on Meg. Dean couldn't find much information about Meg, but he soon made progress on the symbol. It turned out that the mysterious shadow was related to the Zoroastrian cult, and the symbol represented the Dark Lord. This type of demon devoured various parts of the human body, resembling a wild beast. After discussing this, Dean teased Sam about Meg, but Sam's surveillance of Meg was mistaken for a perverted stalker by passers-by. Late at night, Meg went out, and Sam followed her, discovering that she was communicating with someone through a golden cup in a warehouse. 
It turned out that Meg was the one who summoned the Dark Lord. Meanwhile, Dean found out that both victims were born in the city where their mother had died. The brothers decided to send this clue related to their mother's death to their father. They prepared thoroughly, bringing all the tools they could use to fight the demon. With their years-long quest for revenge seemingly coming to an end, Sam even fantasized about returning to school after avenging their mother. However, Dean's childish side was revealed as he felt somewhat afraid of the prospect of Sam leaving once everything was over. At night, the brothers came to the warehouse together to confront Meg. However, Meg had already discovered Dean and Sam. The Dark Lord attacked them in the form of a shadow. It turned out that everything Meg had done was to approach and deceive Sam and use the brothers' safety to lure their father out. In such a tense moment, Meg still tried to seduce Sam. Taking advantage of Meg's carelessness, Sam pushed her away and destroyed the altar. The Dark Lord, having lost its summoning power, was about to backfire on Meg, who was pushed off the warehouse. When the brothers returned safely to the motel, they saw their father, John, who had rushed over. The three discussed the demon that killed their mother and quickly reconciled. However, their peaceful moment didn't last long as the Dark Lord suddenly attacked them again. It turned out that Meg had faked her death when she fell off the warehouse just to deceive their father. After being beaten, Sam realized that the Dark Lord was just a mass of shadows. Cleverly using a light stick to disperse the darkness, the three managed to escape. They still hadn't found a way to defeat the demon, and John insisted on separating from the brothers. The scene then shifts to a group of thrill-seeking friends who decided to explore a haunted house, only to encounter a hanging ghost and managed to flee for their shitty life. As Dean drove, he saw Sam asleep and decided to play a childish prank on him. Sam woke up feeling helpless. The brothers had come to investigate the haunted house. After questioning the thrill-seeking friends, they all pointed to a guy, Craig, who had led them there. Craig told the brothers that the haunted house belonged to a farmer who killed his daughters and then himself to survive a period of famine. The ghosts were trapped inside the house ever since. With no leads, Dean and Sam went to the haunted house to investigate. The ghost detector was rendered useless due to interference from electrical wires. The house was filled with strange symbols that had been recently painted. Inside, the brothers also encountered two self-proclaimed paranormal investigators who were a bit ridiculous. These so-called investigators had set up a ghost website and even mocked the brothers as amateurs. Despite researching various materials, the brothers couldn't find any information about the farmer Craig had described. When Dean got into the car and tried to drive, he was startled by a sudden loud volume. Sam looked smug. It turned out this was his revenge for Dean's earlier prank. One night, some people who didn't believe in the curse visited the haunted house for an adventure. As expected, they ended up shedding blood. This time, a real murder had occurred at the haunted house. The police sealed off the house, but Dean cleverly framed the ghost-investigating duo, who were also there to investigate. This distracted the police, allowing the brothers to enter the haunted house smoothly. To their surprise, they actually encountered a ghost. However, the salt they used had no effect on this particular spirit, forcing the brothers to flee in panic. Back at the motel, Sam complained that the appearance of the ghost they encountered didn't match the legend they had heard. Meanwhile, the ghost website updated the haunted house's story, making the new legend more aligned with the ghost they had encountered. Dean finally realized that the symbols in the haunted house resembled a band's logo. The brothers confronted Craig and forced him to tell the truth. It turned out that there was no legend about the farmer. The haunted house was initially just a prank by Craig and his cousin in order to scare their thrill-seeking friends. However, now that someone had really died, Craig had no idea what to do. The investigation continued, and so did the prank competition between Dean and Sam. Dean secretly poured itching powder into Sam's clothes, causing him to itch all over after taking a shower. In retaliation, Sam smeared glue on Dean's beer bottle, causing his hand to stick to it and nearly tearing off his skin before he could remove it. Despite being itchy, Sam was the first to figure out what they were dealing with this time. There were many symbols on the walls of the haunted house, including a soul seal. This seal acted like a magnifying glass, concentrating the power of meditative thoughts and turning them into reality. The ghost investigating duo had posted the story of the haunted house and the symbol on their website. When visitors to the site imagined the ghost while looking at the symbol, their thoughts gave it the power to materialize. The ghost's appearance would change according to people's thoughts, and once the thought-created entity appeared, it could exist independently. So even removing the website wouldn't solve the problem. 
Dean came up with a solution to deal with this thought-created ghost. He tricked the ghost-investigating duo into believing that the farmer had ended his life with a gun, so the ghost would be afraid of guns. The way to eliminate the ghost, then, was to shoot it. The ghost-investigating duo then posted this ghost-hunting method on their website. As night fell again, the brothers tried to use guns to kill the ghost. The duo also came, but the guns were useless. It turned out that the server had crashed, so people hadn't seen the updated method to eliminate the ghost, and the method to remove the soul seal couldn't be updated successfully. After a fierce fight, Dean burned down the haunted house. With the source of the ghost story destroyed, the thoughts that created the soul seal were also eliminated. Sam remarked that he wondered how many ghosts they had hunted before only existed because people believed in them. Indeed, horrors root in people's thoughts. The scene shifts to John giving his two sons an address, and they hurried over. Although there were no strange reports about this small town, the brothers found that even during after-school hours, there were hardly any children playing in the town. It turned out that the children here had contracted an infectious disease, so most of them stayed at home. The two brothers disguised themselves as doctors sent by the disease control center and infiltrated the hospital. They learned from the chief pediatrician that the sick children were initially thought to have a cold, but it turned out their immune systems were paralyzed. The brothers discovered that this disease only spread among children, and mysteriously, all the children's room windows had been opened. Before the parents returned home, the brothers sneaked into one of the children's rooms and found a strange handprint outside the window. Dean looked at the handprint and recalled that he and his father had encountered this ghostly creature before. In his memories, young Dean was very sensible, taking care of little Sam and listening to the father's advice on how to defend against the ghost. Sam asked why they hadn't killed the ghost back then, but Dean avoided the question. The brothers checked into a hotel and were received by the owner's son, Michael, who also had to take care of his younger brother and prepare meals. Seeing that, Dean fell into his memories again, thinking of how he cared for Sam when they were young. Although little Sam was picky about dinner, he was also considerate towards his older brother. This ghostly creature turned out to be a witch from Albania, with legends tracing back to ancient Rome. Although the witch could absorb the spiritual power of anyone, she preferred the vitality of children. When not absorbing spiritual power, witches liked to disguise themselves as humans, usually as old women. They were most vulnerable when absorbing spiritual power. At the moment they were feeding, they could be killed with blessed silver or lead bullets. Overnight, Michael's little brother fell ill. Dean talked to Michael, who said it was his responsibility to take care of his brother. He blamed himself for not closing the window properly, which led to his brother getting sick. Dean firmly vowed to kill the witch. Meanwhile, Sam found information about the witch in the library. It turned out that such incidents occurred every 15, 20 years, and the pediatrician's face appeared in photos from decades ago, showing that the doctor treating the children was the witch they were looking for. To kill the witch, Dean wanted to use Michael as bait. Sam opposed, but Dean revealed his past that he had been avoiding. In his memories, young Dean was just a child, tired and frustrated from taking care of the younger Sam. One night after Sam fell asleep, Dean went out to relax and play games. When he returned, he found the witch sucking Sam's life energy. Just as he was stunned, their father appeared and drove the witch away. John looked at Dean with disappointment and coldness. He blamed Dean for not taking good care of Sam, and Dean was speechless. Since then, Dean never went against his father's words, feeling guilty towards Sam and making his safety his top priority. This was the reason why Dean was so protective of Sam and never said no to his father's instructions. Dean and Sam told Michael the truth about the witch. Michael was scared, but eventually agreed to be bait to save his brother. Sam apologized to Dean for saying he was a yes-man to their father's orders, and Dean didn't blame him. That night, the brothers set up a camera in the room. Michael pretended to sleep, luring the witch. Just as she was about to suck Michael's life energy, he rolled over and hid under the bed. Dean and Sam arrived in time and shot at the witch. However, she played dead and tried to suck Sam's energy. Dean finally did what he couldn't do years ago. He killed the witch, saved his brother, and all the sick children in the town recovered their health as the witch's death released their life energy. The brothers bid farewell to Michael and continued their journey together. The scene then shifts to a soon-to-die couple who bought a family portrait painting. After admiring the art, they wanted to try some naked body art themselves but ended up dead in bed, their throats slashed by a razor. The bald man in the painting eerily came to life. 
At this time, Dean was pretending to be a talent scout at a bar, hitting on girls, while Sam diligently searched for supernatural incidents in the noisy environment. Following their dad's notebook and a newspaper article, they found the news of the couple's death and three similar murders. Dean was more interested in flirting girls' hormones, but after a crazy night, they began their investigation. Sam searched the dead couple's house, but found nothing unusual. All the art in the house had been auctioned off. The hip-hop-styled brothers didn't fit in with the elegant art world, but Sam caught the eye of the auctioneer's daughter, Sarah. As Dean tried to gossip, he was chased away by the auctioneer after just a few words. The two brothers checked into a fancy hotel they had never stayed at before. Sam wanted to discuss the case, but Dean encouraged him to use his charm to get information about the auction items from Sarah. Sam successfully managed to get a date with her, and they exchanged stories over dinner. In the end, Sam returned to the hotel with the information. After comparing the information with their dad's notebook, the brothers identified a cursed family portrait oil painting. They snuck into the auction house late at night and stole the painting, burning it in an open field. However, they didn't realize that as the painting burned, it reappeared at the auction house. The next morning, they were about to leave when Dean said he left his wallet at the auction house. In reality, he wanted to take Sam back there to see Sarah again. Sam discovered that the painting had returned, and they went to the local records office. The librarian told them that the bald man in the family portrait was a barber, whose name was Isaiah, and rumor has it that he had killed his family with a razor. Sam noticed that Isaiah's appearance in the painting differed from the photo in the records and suspected that his ghost was causing trouble. Although they were discussing serious matters, Dean kept teasing Sam about his relationship with Sarah. Sam found Dean annoying, but Dean said he hoped Sam could move on from his deceased girlfriend. To deal with the painting, Sam had to continue interacting with Sarah, only to find out the painting had been sold. The brothers rushed to the buyer's house, where they also met Sarah, who found the situation suspicious. Unfortunately, they were too late, and the buyer had been killed with a slashed throat. The next day, the trio returned to the buyer's house and found clues in the painting that pointed to a graveyard. In a house at the graveyard, they found the ashes of Isaiah's wife and children, along with toy burial items. Isaiah was buried separately in the public cemetery for his crimes. Taking advantage of Dean searching for information, Sam expressed his feelings to Sarah but was afraid that women close to him would get hurt, so he rejected her request to be together. The brothers dug up Isaiah's body and burned it, then hurried to the buyer's house to steal the painting and bury it. However, they found that Isaiah's foster daughter and the razor in the painting were missing. A creepy laugh from a little girl's ghost locked Sam and Sarah in the room, revealing that the real culprit behind the murders was Isaiah's foster daughter, Melanie, who had slit her foster mother and sibling's throats with a razor. Isaiah discovered her crime, killed her, but was blamed for the murders. Before killing her foster family, Melanie had also killed her biological parents. It's revealed that Isaiah's ghost kept moving in the painting to warn others of the evil Melanie. Although Melanie's body was burned, her hair was made into a burial doll. Now the brothers had to burn the doll. Dean rushed to the rooftop to burn the doll, while Sam and Sarah wrestled muscles with Melanie in the room. In the end, Dean burned the doll just before the ghost could kill them, and Melanie's figure returned to the painting. Sam and Sarah barely escaped with their lives. After resolving the issue, Sam and Dean were about to leave. Having just experienced life and death the night before, Sam no longer suppressed his feelings and bravely kissed Sarah, but without using his tongue. Not far away, Dean saw it and sighed with relief. The scene then shifts to an old man in a bar intently studying a newspaper, scribbling notes when a group of people entered the bar. The old man turned pale and he quickly disappeared. Hurrying back home, the old man found that the group from the bar had broken into his house before he arrived. From the decorations and items in the old man's house, it was clear that he was a demon hunter. Despite grabbing a treasured gun, the old man was killed, and the gun was seized by a vampire named Kate. The brothers were sitting in a tea restaurant, searching for supernatural events but finding nothing. They discussed the old man's murder, and upon hearing his name, Dean realized it sounded familiar. Quickly, he found the man's name in his father's notebook. They drove to the old man's house and, after a search, confirmed his identity as a ghost hunter. They found an empty gun case and a message left by the old man before he died. The message format was similar to those left by John for his two sons. They decoded it as an email address and found a letter left by the old man, which was addressed to John. As Dean hesitated to open the letter, John appeared before them. It turns out the old man had once been John's good friend, but they had a falling out, so the brothers were unaware of his existence. 
John read the letter and asked if they found an antique colt at the old man's house. The gun was important to John, but he didn't explain why, only telling the brothers to accompany him on a monster hunt. It turned out that the group who killed the old man was vampires. In John's understanding, crosses couldn't defeat them, sunlight couldn't kill them, and staking their hearts couldn't kill them either. However, vampires truly survived by drinking human blood. When attacking people, they would reveal their fangs and drag their victims to their lair to drain their blood. Although vampires were not afraid of sunlight, they preferred to sleep during the day and hunt at night. Dead human blood could poison vampires, and the only way to kill them was to behead them. With this information, the vampires had already attacked a hapless couple. John received news of the couple's attack and woke the brothers in the middle of the night to hunt the monsters. At this time, the vampires were enjoying themselves in their lair, tormenting the captured couple. The husband was bitten and killed by a vampire, while the wife was turned into a vampire by Kate. Kate boasted to her boss, Luther, about killing the old man and stealing a trophy gun. Luther held the colt, sensing that it was an extraordinary weapon. Sam is not happy with his father, who always bossed him around. They argued about the importance of the old man's gun, which he had not told his two sons about. The argument escalated. But under Dean's persuasion, John and Sam eventually returned to their respective vehicles, still angry. The father and sons found the vampire's lair and prepared their weapons to charge in. Compared to John's automated weapon storage box, Dean and Sam's equipment looked shabby. As John was arming himself, he hesitated and decided to tell his sons about the antique gun's origin. In 1835, the year of Halley's Comet, a mysterious man made a gun with 13 bullets that could kill all supernatural creatures in the world. For John, the gun meant the ability to kill a demon and avenge his dead wife. During the day, the three infiltrated the vampire's lair, and John stole the gun while his two sons rescued a hostage. Sam wanted to save the wife, but she had already been turned into a vampire. Her screams woke the vampires, and the three men fled, with the vampires tracking them by their smell at night. John sent Dean to steal dead people's blood from a funeral home, while he and Sam had a calm conversation. Before the mother died, he lived a normal life and set up a college fund for both Dean and Sam. However, after his wife's death, John's world was always full of ghosts and monsters. He cared more about keeping his two sons safe than their education and mental state, so he trained them like a drill instructor. Hearing that, Sam reconciled with his father and asked about the college fund. John revealed that he had used $5,000 for weapons. At night, Kate and her accomplice attacked Dean, and in the confusion, her accomplice was beheaded. John shot Kate with an arrow dipped in the dead's blood. They took Kate away, and Luther led a group to track down John, while Dean and Sam infiltrated the vampire's lair, killed the remaining vampires, and rescued the hostages. Luther and his group caught up with John and exchanged Kate for the demon-killing cult. However, John was knocked out by Luther and Kate. Dean and Sam arrived just in time to fight the vampires, and Luther held Sam hostage. But John woke up and shot Luther in the head with the colt, which could kill supernatural creatures with just one bullet, causing the remaining vampires to scatter and flee. After the battle, John finally agreed to let his two sons accompany him to hunt down the demon that killed his wife and Sam's girlfriend. They were a family, and they would stick together. The scene shifts to Meg entering a church. The pastor recognizes her as a demon and quickly runs into the basement, intending to use a weapon against her, but he is instantly killed. Meg plans to use the pastor's death to lure John and his sons. John shares with his sons that the demon appears every once in a while to harm people, and in the households of those affected there's always a baby that is six months old. Obviously the demon is targeting the babies, but he hasn't yet figured out what it wants with them. So far, John has identified the signs of the demon's appearance. A week before an incident occurs, there are dead livestock, temperature fluctuations, and electromagnetic storms around the affected house. The same phenomena occurred a week before their mother and Sam's girlfriend died. Recently, these signs have appeared again, prompting the father and sons to find the location where the anomalies are happening and try to eliminate the demon before it causes more harm. While on the road, John receives a phone call from a friend, learning of the pastor's death at the hands of the demon. Suspecting that the demon knows they are close to finding it, John realizes time is of the essence. He and his son split up, searching hospitals for birth records to find the next potential victim's family. The father and sons employ the same tactics, impersonating hospital staff to obtain information. Sam experiences another headache and premonition while walking. 
Following the clues in the premonition, the trio locates the soon-to-be-victimized family, which indeed has a baby turning six months old in a week. Back at the hotel, Sam has a complete premonition of the demon killing a woman. Dean explains that Sam's premonitions initially occurred only in dreams, but now happen at any time. Sam believes that as they get closer to the demon, his premonitions become clearer. John scolds the two for not informing him about this situation sooner, but Dean counters by pointing out that John never answers their calls, whether it's about Sam's premonitions or Dean's near-death experiences. During the conversation, Sam receives a call from Meg, who demands to speak with John. Meg has killed another of John's friends and threatens to kill everyone connected to him unless he hands over the antique gun. John agrees to Meg's demand. His plan is to bring a fake gun to stall Meg while the brothers stay behind to deal with the demon from the past. Dean bought a fake gun from the antique store and asked his father to promise that he would return home safely. John gave the colt to the two and instructed them, making it feel like the brothers were truly on the path to becoming capable demon hunters. John arrived early at the agreed-upon location and secretly set up a trap to deal with the demon. The meeting with Meg was unpleasant, and she even brought an assistant. The assistant fired a gun, and Meg discovered that the colt John brought was fake. Furious, Meg intended to vent her anger on him, but he cleverly escaped and used the holy water trap he prepared earlier to stop her. However, in the end, John was caught by Meg. On the other side, Dean and Sam were guarding outside the house where an accident was about to happen. As strange events started to occur, the brothers sensed that something was wrong and rushed into the house. Although misunderstood by the homeowner, they managed to save the homeowner's wife and a six-month-old baby in time. In the darkness, Sam also saw the true face of the demon, a pair of yellow eyes. Sam fired at the demon but missed. As a mysterious fire engulfed the house, Sam was stopped by Dean from entering and could only watch the yellow-eyed demon escape through the flames. Back at the motel, Sam felt guilty for not being able to kill the yellow-eyed demon in time. When Sam called his father, Meg answered the phone. Learning that John had been captured, Dean and Sam immediately left the motel. The two of them had to come up with a plan to save their father and kill the demon. Before that, they needed to find an ally, Charlie, who was also a friend of their father. Although he had a falling out with John, Charlie was still friendly to the brothers. He had been studying demons for a long time and even had many materials and spells for trapping demons. Charlie told the brothers that in the past, there were at most four demons appearing in one year. But this year alone, he had heard of 27 demons active in the human world. The reason for the increasing number of demons was unclear, indicating that a horror storm was brewing. Meg suddenly appeared at Charlie's house, demanding the brothers hand over the real demon-killing colt. As it turns out, the brothers had already drawn a demon-trapping spell on the ceiling of Charlie's house, successfully capturing Meg. They wanted to interrogate her about their father's whereabouts, but Meg claimed she had already killed him. Angry, Dean punched Meg, but Charlie informed him that they couldn't hurt Meg's body because the demon was possessing a human host. Charlie provided an exorcism spell, and Sam was responsible for reciting it to cause pain to Meg. However, Meg continued to describe how she killed John, which infuriated Dean. Dean became agitated and wanted to tear Meg's sexy body apart. Finally, Meg revealed that John was actually locked up in a building. Dean asked Sam to recite the spell to send Meg back to hell, but Charlie just stopped him, saying that Meg's possessed body had been badly damaged when it fell from the building, and it was only Meg's possession that kept it alive. Despite this, Dean insisted that Sam recite the spell, sending Meg back to hell to meet Satan. The real girl woke up temporarily and thanked the brothers. Meg had done many terrible things with her body, but it had reached its limit. After telling the brothers John's approximate location, she passed away. Charlie gave the brothers a demon-slaying book, bidding them farewell as they set off to rescue their father. Sam studied the book, while Dean prepared their weapons in silence. However, the brothers ended up arguing over whether or not to bring the colt. Dean wanted to bring the colt to rescue their father, while Sam wanted to save it and the remaining three bullets for the yellow-eyed demon. After all, that's what their father would have wanted. Dean prioritized the safety of their father and Sam over killing the yellow-eyed demon, while Sam was willing to sacrifice himself to exact revenge. Dean reluctantly agreed to leave the colt in the trunk, protected by a talisman. Following the clues, the brothers found the building where John was being held. Sam used a false fire alarm to evacuate the innocent residents and prevent them from being possessed by demons. Disguised as firefighters, the brothers sneaked into the building and, using a ghost detector, found the room where John was imprisoned. 
They trapped the guarding demon with holy water and salt, rescuing their father, who was bound and tortured. Just as they thought they were safe, another demon possessed someone to attack the trio. Dean and Sam were beaten by the demon without any chance to fight back. At a critical moment, Dean pulled out the antique gun and shot the demon attacking Sam. It turned out he had secretly brought the colt with him. However, this shot not only killed the demon, but also the person it had possessed. The three escaped to a small cabin. Sam used salt to prevent any demonic intrusion. Dean felt guilty for killing a person, and also worried that John would be angry with him for using a bullet to kill a lesser demon, rather than the yellow-eyed demon. However, the father reassured him that he had been protecting their family and wasn't mad about the wasted bullet. The lights in the cabin flickered, signaling that the demons seemed to be closing in. John asked Sam for the gun, but Dean noticed something was off. The man before them wasn't their real father. He had been possessed. Dean aimed the gun at him, and when Sam returned, he hesitated only for a moment before siding with his brother. As it turned out, John had been possessed by the yellow-eyed demon Meg's father. The demon, immune to holy water, taunted Dean, saying that John's favorite child was Sam, and that Dean held no importance. It then tried to kill Dean, but John, using his willpower, temporarily suppressed the demon, giving his sons a moment to breathe. Sam rolled over, grabbed the colt, and aimed it at John. The yellow-eyed demon regained control and threatened that if Sam shot, their father would die too. But Sam cleverly shot John in the leg, causing the demon to collapse. Sam first checked on Dean's safety before inspecting John. Suddenly, John woke up, exclaiming that the yellow-eyed demon was still alive, and asked Sam to shoot him in the heart. Dean pleaded with Sam not to do it, but John insisted. Still, Sam couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. A cloud of black smoke emerged from John's mouth as the yellow-eyed demon escaped. John lay on the ground, disappointed and angry, while Dean felt relieved that his father was still alive. Sam drove the injured father and Dean to the hospital. On the way, John argued with Sam about the missed opportunity to kill the yellow-eyed demon. But just then, a truck crashed into their car. The truck driver's eyes were pitch black, a sign of demonic possession. The father and sons were left unconscious in the car, covered in blood, their fate uncertain. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.